Where's everybody? The printer? <laughs> yeah, right, right. One more change. One more change. This is not funny. I still cannot type anything here. Usually it's like a part in class and part take home. Uh, the in class part would be setting up a problem. You know, the first first two or three steps. Yeah, and or and or solve something that's simple. You know, do it by hand, for instance. Um, a simple optimization, you know. <sighs> but I uh, apologize, I need to restart this computer, I don't know for... Uh, let me um, start mentioning about this 
I've gotten a few questions of, uh, from from the uh, uh, one of the problems, problem number 15, um, that asked for was that um, textile problem uh, that. Once you set it up for linear programming, um, you run the code and you read off the you know the outputs and um, the lambda that came out as the shadow prices um, wasn't it a little bit weird? Um, so does did anybody try the simplex method instead? And same weird numbers? Yeah. I, I had numbers I liked, but I actually didn't like the simplex. I thought, I thought the original did it better. I had acceptable, I suppose. OK. Just well, I'll, I'll look then. Um, because um, when I ran what would have been sort of the uh, obvious choice for the metrics A and the, constra you know, the constraints A and B, uh, the sim the um, large scale method gave uh, some, some shadow prices which are not I mean not not realistic okay um, and how can you tell you the shadow prices are not realistic if you read them from the lambda you know from the la lambda output of the, of that uh, program I mean how do you how do you test say you didn't have this uh, fancy way of collecting shadow prices from that command. Shadow prices would have to be? Change the number in the constraint. So it's the sensitivity to the constraint, right? Change the number in the constraint by one and look at the optimal um, value, right? And, um, and again, if you do this with a large scale, then you would see that it's not, it does, it's not consistent, OK? With the number that's been collected through from the Lagrange, from the uh, Lagrange multiplier. Okay. Um, so sometimes, again, sometimes trying, you know, I guess, if something doesn't look reasonable, if it, if if it looks reasonable, that's you know, uh, that's that, right? I mean, you, you make the interpretation and you you move forward, right? Uh, and again, at this stage, it may not be very clear, you know, what is reasonable and what is not, right? Um, but I would say that trying uh, maybe two different methods would be, you know, two different methods for this Limprog uh, would be a way, or uh, as I said, brute force, just just make the sensitivity analysis your uh, on your own. Uh, I should also mention that the implementation of linear programming or any of this uh, methods, sim simplex or large scale, um, the, in MATLAB is you know it's um, it's not foolproof. So, um, in fact, no implementation is like uh, universal. At this point, if you have a large scale problem like a large number of variables, a large number of constraints. Um, you know, the, in theory, everything should work fine, right? But when you, when you ask a computer to do it, you run out into these cases where things don't, um, you know, certain errors creep up, you know, cer certain things, certain limiting behaviors um, appear that, that you didn't expect, right? And uh, so it's, it's really sort of an active, Field, uh, in fact, just I, th I think a couple of years ago, there's been a um, kind of a new uh, algorithm for solving linear and nonlinear programming problems. So, uh, developed I think at Stanford, that is now being com commercialized. So, various commercial packages. 
uh, implement that, that algorithm. And um, uh, COMSOL is one of them. So, so um, <clears throat> I don't know what's going on with this, but just just to, to show you that, that there are there are I mean it's it's an ongoing process. There's nothing like this is it, and now we can use it, close our eyes, and and not uh, you know just trust trust the computer hundred percent. Please get this started. <laughs> we might have to live with this uh, resolution if that's okay. It's really small on my screen. Okay, well, let's see if it. Hopefully, I can run some uh, some codes. I posted uh, the code for. Well, you probably have seen this uh, dirt problem that we did yesterday uh, last time in class, and I posted two more codes here. Uh, in chapter four, so we're going to start talking about chapter four, dynamic models. Okay, so let me. Uh, do you like pink or white? We could sell or switch between the two. Um, okay, so, oh, this is interesting. Now I cannot write on the screen. Okay, now I can write on the screen, but he cannot see what I'm writing. Let's see if there is a steady state here. Now, you Okay, it's either you or me. Who, who, um. Hmm? Any idea what to do? Yeah. So if if it's on the screen, then it's um, if it's on the screen, then it's it's also on my machine. But I I when I write here, it appears here. So it's not. Um, I could use that. Yes, please. See, now you can see I cannot see anything. Thank you. So let's see, how many people have differential equations here? <laughs> okay, that wasn't a trick question. Uh, how many of you had have seen uh, systems of differential equations in your course? Oh, okay. Um, so it means we can skip uh, chapter four, I guess. 
Out of the window. This is six months old. It's pretty old. <laughs> we can we can get a new one now. Huh? Yeah. iPad. Yeah, that's right. Now wait. Hold. Don't. Uh... Okay. All right, so it looks like I can at least write on this. All right, so let's talk about dynamic models. Dynamical systems first. Okay, so uh, so you've seen differential equations that are of this form, where x is kind of the state variable or it's some something that um, if you know it at each time then you know the system that, it, that, this, that this equation describes right so that's why we call it state variable um, and it's typically a function of time so we can it's like we track a certain, ver you know, a certain um, uh, process in time, and all this is saying is that this is a rate of change, right? Um, it's it's a law that, that says how the rate of change on this of this variable depends on the current state. Okay, and this system is or this equation is um, understood sort of well if you can solve it explicitly that's great right but not always you can solve um, even first order equation explicitly so alternative is to have what's called a direction field right excuse me uh, yeah so the direction field Um, and that amounts to doing what? So in the XT plane you do for instance well let's say at, at uh, time zero you can do it at time zero for each X for each value of X you uh, draw a direction that has slope equal to what? the right hand side right? So you have the right-hand side, so the slope equals the f at the value x where it's where you plot it, where you compute it. And again, this slope can change You know, I mean that that means the function is depends on x, so this can change uh, with respect to x. Could also have x negative here, something like that. So, okay. Now, this is what you do when uh, at t equals zero, and then you, you have to do it at all. Kind of, you have to fill this plane uh, with its directions, which of course you cannot do it by hand. So you just 
I guess you just uh, illustrate this on on a few, and of course with a computer it would be much easier to do. And what you notice here when you when you do this is that um, if there is no t in the right hand side, if there is no t dependence in the right hand side, so so the right hand side only depends on x, then uh, at different times t the the slopes are the same, so the directions are the same, right? So this is a situation of what's called an autonomous system, or an autonomous equation, right? So this is uh, right hand side is time independent, means is an autonomous uh, equation or system, and that is to distinguish between the case when the right hand side would not be depending on, or would be depending on the time. So what's an example of that? So more general, uh, you could have dx dt as a function of t and x, right? In which case, what is the, um, it's, you have the possibility of the direction to be, let's say it's a simple um, function like this, so it has this, the slopes are of this, but at a different time it would, it would look totally different, right? For the same x, a different time it would look different, okay? And then at another, another time it would be, again, maybe different. Okay, so this would be a case of autonomous system, uh, non-autonomous system. equation in this case, right? Okay, so what do we do with this direction field? How does this relate to the solutions of our of our differential equation? Mm -hmm. Coming back to the first example here, if I have a um, initial condition, so at time zero I know that what x is at time zero, right? To solve this, system, this equation would amount to would amount to do what? Today I just cannot write on these computers. Ah, okay. But I want to find uh, a curve that fits this direction field, right? So, for instance, that might be uh, this, a, a curve that that um, fits the direction field at all points, right? If it starts there, but if it starts here, it might actually look like this, right? It might look like this, and so forth. Also. Right, so these are different solutions for this differential equation, and they correspond typically to different initial conditions. Right? If it is uh, non-autonomous, you know, it's the same the same issue. Except now it's it's going to have to adjust, right, to kind of at each time there's going to be some sort of different uh, you know think about it like wind wind is changing conditions are changing as time evolves so you could be starting I didn't say you could be starting at one point here and follow a certain trajectory a certain uh, solution right if you start at this moment of time but for the same x if you start at a different moment of time, which is let's say here at time zero, then you would, you could be doing a totally different trajectory, right? So 
there is actually a fundamental difference between autonomous and non-autonomous systems or equations. And that is, when you look at the solutions, at the picture of the solution, what do you see? What do you notice? Hmm? Right, they're consistent in the sense that they're translating, they're, they're translation invariant. You take the same picture and you just kind of shift it by a little bit, right? The direction field is going to be the same. So the solutions will be the same, right? Whereas here, it will look, I mean, my picture is not great, but uh, if you shift, if you kind of translate this in time, then you're going to see a different picture, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm, just, I'm trying to get lost in how you have an autonomous system that's dynamic. Because to me, a dynamic system has to be dependent on time. Yeah. Right? Because it's not just a dynamic Well, it's dynamic system because, because uh, your variable is time dependent. So it's dynamic in the sense that given an initial condition, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be time dependent, right? Individual solutions. But it's auton in, in the autonomous case, it basically says that you can start at time zero and follow your dynamics, or you can start at time ten, the same location, and you're going to follow exactly the same dynamics. I mean, the best way to think is in the airplane. You are taking off, right? You're you're waiting to be cleared, right? And there's no wind, okay? And you have your everything's pre-programmed. Well, it doesn't matter if you start now or you start in two minutes. Your trajectory is going to be the same, right? It's dynamic, but it's going to be the same. It's going to be not depending on the time on your start motion. Whereas if there's wind, if there's like a thunderstorm, right? If you start now or in two minutes, even though you're, you know, you're following exactly the same, you know, physics, physical laws, your trajectory will be different. Okay. Um, so uh, you can actually. Experiment this uh, on your own. I linked here something that's quite powerful um, called it's it's a it's a MATLAB code for interactively kind of uh, plotting this kind of um, uh, direction fields. It's called D field eight. Um, as usually, just cop uh, you know copy and paste it in your in your MATLAB. Um, on your on your local machine, and it has four thousand lines of code, so you don't want to even look at this. Um, but again, it's it's sort of a code developed by a professor at Rice University, and you know he graciously kind of gave it uh, gave it away, and it's 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 kind of used throughout. Uh, you know the best sort of tool for um, um, solving differential equations with MATLAB. So here's an example of that: x squared minus t. That's not a great example, but I mean it's not a function. It's not a differential equation that you might uh, want to solve anyway um, on paper. But here's here's a, here's a time equals zero, and x is I don't know between negative two and two. And this is how the direction field looks like, okay? I don't know if you can see it, but um, so I'm not I'm not talking about how MATLAB actually feeds this curve, but that's basically how it solves the differential equation with this initial condition, right? X equals zero uh, at time equals zero, right? And it, it uh, you saw that it solves also backward in time, which okay, which you can do. So that's that's one trajectory, right? But now imagine now look at if I start at the same x equals zero but at a different time, right? It looks different, right? I mean it has sort of. 
And you can do this, I mean, with a bunch of points. In fact, it's not that, uh, I mean, I'm just, pl I'm just uh, hitting x equals 0 a different time, so you can see that it's, it's, it's non-autonomous, right? But uh, the best way is to kind of to see this fix, you know, uh, fix at time 0 and take different initial conditions. It's actually even more dramatic to see what? That there's kind of a value here for x below and above which the, the dynamics is, is dramatically different, right? OK, so you cannot really do this by hand, I believe. You cannot solve it explicitly by hand. But be my guess to try it out anyway. x, x prime equals x squared minus t. Doesn't look that um, bad, but uh, it is not. You know, you cannot solve it by hand. Uh, let me let me switch to something that we're going to be using quite a bit, called a logistic equation. And it's using p rather than x, but that doesn't matter. Um, and then it has a coefficient times uh, the right-hand side is rx times 1 minus x over k, or p. And if you proceed with this, uh, this is the direction field that you're going to get. Oh, and by the way, this is not uh, that great because it doesn't show the whole picture. So let me... Let me do, um, uh, what do I want to do? I want to do some negative, negative 5 to 15. OK. All right, so now uh, let's identify what t equals 0 is. So this is what t equals 0. OK. All right, so now you can see an autonomous system, this is autonomous because there is no t dependence in the right hand side. Okay? And again, what's that feature in the in the um, you know in this direction field phase portrait? It's translation invariant, right? So it's now individual in, individual trajectories are not constant, right? You start you start somewhere here and with time, as time evolves, you kind of reach a certain, you know, you do something, right? So that's dynamic. But again, uh, if you start at a later time at the same point, it's going to be doing the same thing with that delay time, time delay, okay? All right, so it's, it's a kind of a great little tool. Um, it won't solve the differential equations uh, exactly. So, if you need more than just the picture or the behavior, then you might need to solve those equations exactly. So, let's start with the logistic equation. So, this is dx dt equals. Well, let's just do it really simple. x times 1 minus x. Okay? So, if nobody told you when you started this first time, you know, this is a f kind of a simplest uh, type of first order OD that you, you were asked to solve in, uh, in, um, in your introductory course, right? Um, but if, if, if nobody told you that, you know, there is a direction field, there, there is a picture that you can relate this to, um, then that was probably a mistake because the picture is very kind of uh, suggestive. So think about the right-hand side. So the right-hand side is a quadratic equation in X, right? So I want to I want to plot these directions according to the values of this quadratic function, right? Now the, the, this quadratic function function 
if I were to plot the right hand side versus x would be a parabola pointing downwards, right? And with x intercept at 0 and 1. Okay? So this is and what do I take out of this, you know, this information? Can I help? Can it, can that help uh, uh, figure out the direction field? I guess by hand. Well, when x is zero, regardless of what t is, what is the right hand side when x is zero? Zero, right? So, so this means the direction at x equals zero is zero, and I can do it, you know, at several points. Again, it's independent of t. Uh, it's the same thing at ooh, at x equals 1, right? The direction field is going to be 0. I mean, the directions are going to be horizontal, right? Um, what happens in between? Like if x is in between 0 and 1, the right-hand side is positive, right? And you can see it's 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 the maximum pos it's it's positive. What's the maximum here? Is I think it's a quarter. So, right when x is a half, a half times a half is a quarter, and that's the maximum it can actually be. So the slope, the steepest slope is a quarter in uh, in slope. I don't know what that angle means, but let's say it's like this, right? Okay. And finally, um, well, an intermediate are kind of smaller, right? And smaller, I mean, uh, less deep, less steep, and again, less steep above. You can see how inefficient it, it is to do it by, uh, by hand, obviously. Uh, also, when, it's, when you're above one, what happens with the slope? It's actually going to be negative because that's where the right hand side is when x is greater than 1 is negative right so sometimes we put this pluses and minuses to indicate the sign of the right hand side right whether you have increasing or decreasing and then decreasing below 0 again and by the way this is kind of steeper and steeper as you go below right okay so the question is, uh, can we actually, well, we can fit this with a computer. We can fit the solution curve, and you saw it, right? You saw it on the computer. But the question is, can you, uh, you know, is there something explicit you can say? So for instance, if x starts here, I don't know, at one point, it's clear that it's going to go up, right? But how do you know it's going up all the way? I mean, where is it stopping? Well, obviously, you won't be able to go above 1 because above 1, things are... The, the trend is to go down, right? But how do you know that, you know, so how do you know... Well, maybe I should start with this. If you start with 1, well... Um, because the slope is zero, right? The horizontal line fits that direction field. Yeah? So in other words, the function x equals constant 1 solves this differential equation, right? x equals 1 makes this zero, and being constant makes the derivative zero. Right? The same with x equals zero. So these are called the steady states. Right? So the steady states, or equilibria, are solutions, x star, right, such that, or our points, let me say our points such that x is constant x star is a solution. Okay? And that means that the right hand side
right? At x star must vanish. Right? Since the derivative of a constant in time is zero. Right? So in our case, the right hand side is x times one minus x. It's nice because it's it's a uh, factored, so you could get x equals zero. Or x equals one. Okay? So these are the steady states, meaning that a solution starting at, at that value stays, stays uh, for all times at that value, right? So this is going to be kind of one thing that we're going to be looking at is, is when you have a system, and not just one equation, but a system of equations, is to identify where are the, po where are the possible steady states. Um, and then, what happens with the solutions that don't start at a steady state? So, as I was saying before, if you start, let's say, at a point, this, this point x, obviously the trend is that it's going to be increasing, but how is it going to be increasing? Where is it going to be going to eventually, and so forth? Okay? Can you trust the computer always? And the answer is no, if you've seen it repeatedly today. Um, but where is it going, right? How high does it does this value go? Okay. Now, of course, from the computer, from that, uh, did I show that? Yeah. So from here, it's clear that this is this is uh, that equation, but with a different constants. So take r to be. By the way, in this code, you can change. Th these are the parameters, right? So if I change r and k to 1, then and then I have to change this. The window so I can see it, right? So how how do we know that it actually goes towards 1? Well, there's no uh well, there 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 are ways to see this, but at this point, for the logistic equation, we know how to solve it exactly. Okay, so analytic solution or exact solution um, can be found because this this equation is what's called what kind of equation is this if you have to solve it by hand separable right so so you separate the variables this is separable um, and then you integrate right so you inter you have to integrate this rational function 1 over x times 1 minus x and it's not um, too hard to do it by partial fraction all right but in case you forgot that partial fraction decomposition um, then this is how it will look like right um, then how do you find the constants a and b Right, so um, you could do the standard way and just you know find the common denominator and then identify the coefficients, get a system of equations, right? Um, but how I like to say it is is you just solve it visually. Um, you kind of cook up those 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 um, cof those uh, constants. Now, that's not a way to you know, teach how to do uh, uh, partial fractions, but 
if if somebody faces you and says, "Isn't that clear that a and well, a is one and b is one uh, satisfies this?" Well, again, it takes some uh, common denominator, but you can see it. The numerator becomes exactly what you need, which is one, right? So now, how you do this? As I said, you have to do it through. You know, if, if it's not obvious, you have to do it through the methods that that you know. Uh, but I'm just going to use this. So right now, it's going to be one over x plus one over one minus x dx equals the integral of dt is just t plus a constant. So this is natural log of x minus natural log of one minus x in absolute values t plus c. So so you've actually solved. Right? You've integrated this equation because now there's no more integrals. And now if you if you can do if you can find x that's great, and we can, but you probably remember how few well there aren't many examples where you can actually uh, proceed with this computation until you find x explicitly. So uh, so let's see, what what is uh you exponentiate both sides, right? So you get x one minus x is a constant e to a t, where c is could be positive or negative, right? Or even zero, or even infinite, right? So the first thing here to notice is that this computation doesn't quite make sense if x is one. Right? But if x is not 1, then you can do this. Uh, and now you can solve for x. Makes it a linear equation. So it's x 1 plus c e to the t as c e to the t. So finally, x is c e to the t over 1 plus c e to the t. Okay, and uh, what is this? C is any real number, and of course, or uh, there's also the solution where x is, as I said, equals one, right? That was kind of lost in this computation. Um, but this is a general solution of that, of that logistic equation. Is that right? So now... Well, x cannot equal 1 in this form. But x equals 1 is a solution, as we saw before. So because we lost it, we, we assumed x is not 1, so we can divide by 1 minus x. Then it doesn't mean that x was, could not be equal to 1, right? So that, that's why you have x equals 1 as an added. But this is, uh, you know, like if you start with a half, right? One can find the constant so that this thing is at time 0. So given initial condition x at 0 is x naught you can find the constant right so you get x naught is c over 1 plus c yep so you can find the constant c to be uh, what do you get? C is x naught plus x naught C. So C is x naught over 1 minus x naught, right? Okay, so for instance, let's uh, think about 
we were talking about uh, what happens with solutions that start in between 0 and 1, like start at 1 half, right? If x0 is a half, what is c? Well, is a half over a half, that's 1, right? So what is x as a function of t? Is e to the t over 1 plus e to the t? Yep. So the, the graph that you saw there for x equals a half, starting with x equals a half, I think you can clear these. Uh, there's a way to clear all of this, clear figure. Oh, I clear the whole figure. Uh, there's a way to just clear the um, the solutions only. Okay, so so again, if you are to uh, between, I said one half. So this is the point where I want to start, and this is the solution, right? Uh, well, this solution is exactly that function, or this is the graph of that function, right? How can you see this? Well, as well, one thing is to plot this function, but uh, the, the key thing was, as t goes to infinity, where is this thing going? Okay, So you can see it's going to hmm? in this case to 1, right? I mean, one way to see this is, is to um, divide by e to negative t, so e to negative t plus 1, right? And you know that e to negative t goes to 0 as t goes to infinity. So that's why the limit is 1, right? And again, you can do this for also for uh, in general. So in general, so for general x naught, we said x of t is c e to t over 1 plus c e to a t, so that's the same as 1 over 1 over c plus um, excuse me, 1 over c e to the minus t plus 1. And what was 1 over c? Well, c was x naught over 1 minus x, so this is 1 over x, 1 minus x naught over x naught. Right, so you can see the solution you can rewrite the solution as 1 over, uh, let's see, 1 plus 1 minus x naught over x naught e to the minus t. So now, what do you... Um, what do you conclude? If x naught is, well, if x naught is zero, this this is not not a good uh, way of representing, it, right? But if x naught is zero, the solution we know is zero. If x naught is between zero and one, this quantity is positive.
So this thing goes to 1 over 1, which is 1, right? If x0 is above 1, what if? this would be negative, but this is still going to 0, right? So all the solutions actually eventually go to uh, that value 1, right? Uh, the only thing that's concerning is uh, some concern is what if x is negative? X naught is negative. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. True. Uh, but. You see the graph shows, you know, th everything goes to 1 unless you're starting below 0, in which case you go to negative infinity, right? So can we see it that this goes to negative infinity? This thing should go to 0, which means this thing should go to negative 1. And I'm not seeing that, but uh, okay, well, anyway, I mean, the point is this is an explicit solution. that tells you, you know, given the initial condition, that's what x is going to be. Uh, at x, given x0, this is what the solution will look as a function of t, right? It should be, should be obvious, but I don't see it right now. That it goes to negative infinity, okay, when x is not is, is negative. All right, so, Again, what, I, what I'm saying here is this is kind of a rare case uh, that you can solve explicitly the equation, right? And then you can match with a, with a picture. Okay, so this is what happens when you have one, one variable, one, one state variable. Uh, you can actually relate a dynamical system or, or the dynamics, uh, the equation describing that, with uh, um, with a with a with a direction field, and you can analyze. You know what happens as uh, time evolves. You can you can identify what are the steady states and so forth. Um, but certainly, one D is not enough. So you could have two dimensional or, or several dimensional ones, and the Easiest example is um, is what's called a pendulum, nonlinear pendulum. In which k, in which um, so the the system that you're describing is actually you know plain old. Uh, pendulum that's fixed at one end and it's it's kind of oscillating at the other end right and the Newton's law you know if you have some friction Newton's law of motion the acceleration is related to the forces so assuming this has some mass it ends up being like a second order equation like that right and it's nonlinear because of this term okay so, how do you uh, solve, how do you try to solve this system? I mean, it's a, it's a second order equation, right? But actually, it doesn't have an exact solution. You cannot write theta is this function of t. Okay? If you didn't have this term, if you didn't have the sine, if you had something like a theta, just instead of sine theta, then you could solve for, 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 for theta. But because it's nonlinear, you cannot solve it. So 
the, the typical way to study this system is, or this, this uh, physical system, is to convert a second order equation to a first order system. And there, there's not a unique way in general to do this, but uh, one standard one is a standard one is to call the derivative of the variable theta to be um, you know the new variable, a second variable. So that would be the momentum. And then uh, write the the rate of change or the derivative of the mom of the second variable in terms of both variables, right? So this is just, of course, this is just the um, second derivative of theta. So it's minus sine theta minus k omega, right? Right? So now you see a, basically a system of two equations, which brings the question of how do you study systems? I mean, is there something related to, uh, similar to the case of one dimensions? And the answer is yes, but it, it is going to be a little bit more complicated. So. I'm going to, I mean, I gave you that example, and actually I can show you the picture that comes out of this uh, system, but this is what it boils down to. I have now a, a system of differential equations where x is, you know, let's say it has two variables. It doesn't have to be even more, uh, start with the two, two variables, x, x1, x2, and uh, f could be f1, f2, right? So literally, I'm looking, I'm, I'm looking at dx1 equals f1 and dx2 equals x2, f, f2. Yeah? And the question is, if, if there is such a system, how do we study it? Well, there is... <laughs> Think about it as, as a similar concept as it was for the one-dimensional direction field, but this time I have to take into account that um, the x1 and x2 are interconnected. So this the solution. So the solution will be x of t, which is x1 of t and x2 of t. Okay. Think about uh, plotting this. Well, to plot it, you need basically the x1, x2 plane versus t, right? So imagine that I have a solution that starts at time zero at this point. Okay. And again, we're going to consider it to be uh, autonomous, so it doesn't really matter. So we're just always going to start our, our uh, things at time equals zero. That's the advantage of autonomous systems. Okay, And then this is going to have to fit some sort of a direction curve, right? A direction field, excuse me. So at each point, at each, at each moment of time, this is going to have some, well, I don't want to call them slopes, but it's going to have a direction, right? There's going to be a slope in the x1 direction and a slope in the x2 direction. Right, but imagine what happens in the in the um, in the x t, in the x one x two plane. Well, this is over. This is in time, right? But the projection, sort of, with this trajectory, is going to describe some curve in the x one x two plane. All right, so that's. That's how I would like to understand now, how I would like to think about this, because soon we're going to be run out of a dimension that we can visualize. Right? If, it's, if I have three variables, 
<coughs> I cannot even do this plot, right? All I'll be able to do is kind of see the trace of the trajectory in that state state space. So that's that's why even in, in two, uh, when I have two variables, it's best to think about it as a so focus on instead of this versus time, focus on the, what's called a phase plane. In which case, I'm just looking at the x1, x2, and now I can talk about directions in the x1, x2 plane as being, so this is going to be dx1 dt equals f1 and dx2 dt is f2. So, so at each point I'm going to have to plot this direction field again, but it, keep in mind that it's different than, than the one where I have one variable and time. Okay? So for that, let me show you this. Um, there is another code called pplane, which again has thousands of lines of code, so you just want to copy and paste, save it here. I think we can just quit this. Okay, so here's an example. I'm, I'm going to take the pendulum here. And you probably don't like this, but it says theta, omega, omega, theta, and so forth. And um, the first thing that's going to do is going to plot this direction field in the phase plane. Now, take a look at this. Okay, so what are these errors? These errors are no longer s slopes of, I mean, they're not slopes of the, of the solution, right? And so we stop talking about slopes of of the actual uh, of the actual um, uh, directions, but instead, at each point, so it's saying that if the solution were to hit this point, you would have to follow this direction, right? And so forth, right? So, again, you ask the computer to uh, find sort of. Given an initial condition, find the, the trace of the solution, right? So this is, not, I mean, you don't really see the solution here as, as a function of time, right? If you, if you were to plot this as a function of time, you'd have to start there and then, then do this, if time is going this way, right? Instead, you just see the state at, as time evolves, like the states that have been, that have been visited, right? And of course, this this arrows also indicate like in which uh, direction it actually is, is is described that that trajectory, right, or orbit. Now, <clears throat> this is the pendulum. So this is all this is saying is that it's uh, different initial conditions correspond to different trajectories, right? And because it's nonlinear, you get all kinds of interesting behaviors. Uh, you can also get this, what appears to be a repetition in theta, but the fact that it kind of repeats itself, this has nothing to do with anything except that theta is an angle. So once it passes 2 pi, so this is 0, and then this is 2 pi, right? So in a way, in a way the phase portrait just should stop like between negative pi and pi, right? Depends on how you measure the... the um, okay? And then you just draw conclusions. Now, what's one thing that needs to be... Um, you, where do you start this analysis? Well, of course, if you have such a tool and you draw a nice picture, it's, not, it's still not enough, right? So, 
one thing to do is to say find a, a steady state or an equilibrium point and guess what the computer will find lots of things lots of information about this equilibrium point and we'll t we're going to talk about a lot of these things but this is just theta is zero and omega is zero meaning the pendulum is sitting straight down right and with no initial momentum but this is not the only one there is another critical uh, there's another equilibrium which is when that is pi so this is it's it's like uh, on top again with no moment no initial momentum right and I think these are the only two and then then they keep repeating by um, a period of 2 pi um, and so so that's kind of the one of the tools but certainly uh, one has to talk about and we're going to talk about this um, start talking about steady states steady state um, or equilibrium and uh, go from there I think I've posted the next homework assignment so I'll ask you to go through the first example in the in the chapter 4 4.1 I don't have a code for that because it's not anything that you should code. It's basically just um, illustrating the steady states for a system of two equations with two unknowns. Okay, a concrete, well, a more concrete example. And we're going to go through this on Monday, but you can have a head start. Um, and then we're going to go and talk about the actual codes, you know, for not just steady state but time dependent uh, dynamics okay thank you